Good evening and welcome for this very special occasion. Thank you for being here. Tonight we have a rare and precious opportunity to receive teachings from a very accomplished and also wonderfully joyful and youthful teacher in the embodiment of Shechen Rabdrum Rinpoche, who's the seventh Rabdrum Rinpoche. The seat of the Rabdrum Rinpoche is, is Shashan Monastery, established in Eastern Kham many centuries ago. Rinpoche was born as the grandson of Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, one of the greatest luminaries of Tibetan Buddhist tradition of our time, of all times. At his birth, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche had a dream that Rabdrum Rinpoche was the combined embodiment of all three of the main tulkus of Shashan Monastery, Shashan Rabjam, Shashan Kongchul, and Shashan Jeltsap Rinpoche's. Rinpoche began his training under the tutelage of Dilgo Kense Rinpoche at the ripe age of three years old, and was present for practically every teaching ceremony, empowerment that Dilgo Kense Rinpoche gave for the remainder of his life. And so he is the living embodiment of the tradition and the teachings that Kense Rinpoche brought together and transmitted during his lifetime. When uh, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche established Shashan Monastery in Nepal in 1980, he empowered Rajam Rinpoche as its abbot. After Dilgo Kense Rinpoche's passing in 1991, Rajam Rinpoche dedicated his life to preserving <coughs> and furthering the activities of Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. He expanded Shashan Monastery, which today hosts almost 500 monks. He rebuilt and expanded a nunnery in Bhutan, which today hosts almost 200 nuns, helping to empower women in their education and leadership of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, in particular of Shashan. And in particular, he established a school for young monks and nuns at Shashan that is unique in that it grants an education in both the religious tradition of Shechen as well as secular education, fulfilling those requirements as well for those who participate in that. Rinpoche has in particular focused on preserving and transmitting the huge volume of teachings that Kensei Rinpoche embodied and passed on to him and is a veritable living Dharma treasury of that vast quantity and depth of teachings and is sought out by teachers all over the world to receive those empowerments and transmissions from Rav Drum Rinpoche because he not only contains the transmission of them but is the living embodiment of them having internalized the meaning of those teachings. We are very fortunate to be 
receiving an explanation from Rimshe on a text tonight that was written out as a letter of advice to a student of Dilgo Kense Rimshe called Discovering the Natural State. At a certain point, we'll collect questions and I will read a few of them towards the end of tonight's proceedings. And uh, there'll be a short lung of a practice of Saraswati for those of you that know about that at that point. And so with no further comments, on behalf of everyone here and everyone in the future, the many people that will see this video, hear this recording, please Rinpoche turn the wheel of Dharma. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg. Grandson part is true, others a little bit overrated. <laughs> Realization part is way overrated. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I really don't have uh, much to say. Um, something that you didn't hear before, or something new. But <clears throat> whenever we kind of host uh, this kind of event, especially now, recently, just yesterday, is the 33th uh, anniversary of Chamsi Tengu Kenzer Mbashi's Paranirvana. So he passed away 33 years ago, and yesterday was 32nd Paranirvana. So, when I <clears throat> have this kind of event and when I sort of uh, pretend to give a talk, which um, many people sort of say that re recall of memories of Timuchen Zerimbache or, or rem remember Timuchen Zerimbache. So, even though I don't have much to say, I think my purpose is served because in sutras and tantras, all says that remembering your guru is the, uh, how do you say, the best of all the development stage of practice given. So I think uh, when we get together and I get a chance to talk a little bit about my experience with the uh, Kenzer Rinpoche, and many of you I see <coughs> uh, old friends, I don't mean old, old, I mean old friends. <laughs> Age old, I mean old friends. <laughs> and you, many of you have such a wonderful memory of Kenzer Rinpoche. So I sort of physically maybe look a little bit like Rinpoche. Of course, not inwardsly, realization wise. But uh, so I, I feel very happy uh, to do this, uh, this kind of uh, event. <clears throat> so today, I think the subject uh, here, it's like uh, mentioned, uh, it's a letter written by Ken Zerimbache to, I think, some of, uh, one of his students. Uh, <clears throat> so whenever Ken Zerimbache write a letter to his uh, friend students, it's always, he always write in beautiful uh, poem, poetry. Okay. Pottery, and is always kind of teaching in his letter about depends according to the the one the recipients of the letter, which would always kind of give advice or practice. So even Rinpoche's letters, I think uh, we have uh, collected them together and made it into booklet like an advice. So today I think Vivian or somebody choose it's one page letter which is a little bit challenging for me to speak on it. Maybe she's testing me, I don't know. And uh, one page later and two hours, so that will be <laughs> more challenging for me. So let's start with, I was born. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I will uh, try try my best uh, to kind of go through this these teachings, and um, Sean, my friend, will help me 
to translate. Sanji Gunji Jini Jesu, the Jini Jinam in Jabayan, to the Jinaki, to Moja Pemandonga, Limber Sorwande. So even though it's it's a reading letter, it's a kind of a Dharma activity. So I think it's a good to generate or proper attitude that you're listening to this talk with the proper motivation for the sake of all mother sentient beings that uh, we are doing this uh, um, Dharma event together. So please have your uh, right motivation. Ah,前一英子，做木工上木，还是这边用钱写钱嘛？大家根本中间阿没做，一些做着帮忙去送去。他确实硬，嗯，这边他他们就差不多。啊，你工作上木，工作上木存钱去，但你怕是做，他硬
reach that goal, if one kind of turns away from or renounces the maya within which one finds oneself. <coughs> So, so he, he told me not to say so. <laughs> so he's coming up. But sometimes he's saying so. Anyway. <laughs> People uh, come to uh, join Dharma, practice Dharma, with many different reasons, I feel. Uh, of course, in East, if you're in, born in the kind of Buddhist world, then your parents are all Buddhist and they sort of uh, uh, sort of get into it without really like choosing to be a Buddhist. So sort of you are born into the family of Buddhists. So in the West, I think many people have background, different backgrounds or different uh, faiths. But somehow, then some people feel inspired by the Buddhist uh, teaching and Buddhist philosophy. So, they get into interest in joining into Dharma. So, sometimes we have different reasons why you uh, join the Dharma. Um, maybe sometimes they go through some difficulty in life, then they're looking for some kind of solution. Then with the hope of, by becoming Buddhist and learning uh, Dharma, then they will be kind of free from their difficulties. And then sometimes people uh, of course, most of the people who join Dharma because they have felt some kind of unsatisfactory of the worldly life, then they um, hear about the Dharma and the teaching, then they ins inspire. <coughs> so, in any case, I think the, any teaching, Mahayana, or Shavakayana, or Vajrayana, I think we have to think within the framework of the Four Noble Truths, the first teaching of Buddha. So first is Dukkha, dissatisfactory fashion of dissatisfaction of the dissatisfaction of the samsaric world. That uh, brings us mind, turns mind, our mind into Dharma. So if we have, even we have different purpose to join the Dharma in the beginning, but I think to become a good Buddhist practitioner, we have to have the sense of feeling of renunciation. So even though you are joining the Dharma because of uh, different reasons, but if you want to become a good practitioner, then I think we have to develop this kind of sense of uh, renunciation feeling by thinking in, in our world that uh, everyone is chasing for some kind of happiness in life and then becoming the most powerful in the world, not necessarily make you happy. Becoming the richest person in the world, not necessarily make you happy. So I think it's very much kind of, uh, uh, we can see that uh, relative world, samsari world, no matter how, uh, how we search, how we kind of, um, <clears throat> how, me, how, how we success in life, doesn't really bring happiness. So, like Buddha's teaching, the dukkha, as long as we have the uh, ignorance, uh, desire, hatred, jealousy, anger, then we don't have uh, peace of mind. So I think this thing has to be uh, come in, bring into your mind, no matter what practice, even you do Maha Yoga, or even you do Maha Anu Adi Dzogchen, whatever practice, I think the base is we must have uh, the sense of renunciation. So therefore, I think in this, I think Bacha's letter is sort of emphasize on um, uh, thinking, on con contemplating on the precious human life that uh, it's correspond with the, I think the first teaching of the Buddha, Dukkha, suffering. Then when you... <clears throat> No, the cause of the suffering is really desire, hatred, anger, jealousy. Then the second teaching comes. The cause of the suffering is desire, hatred, anger, jealousy, and especially the ignorance. Then how to deal with this? Can we, can we get rid of these negative emotions? Mm. So sensation is possible to get rid of these negative emotions because 
it is not inherent, inherent to us. Our true nature is pure, so the negative emotions sort of inherit. So even we uh, think uh, our day-to-day -day life, we cannot be angry for complete whole day. We can be maybe angry for a few hours and then again it sort of disappears. Sometimes there, so some kind of hate might remain longer, but we can really see that all these negative emotions comes and goes and comes and goes. So it doesn't mean that it is con constantly is there. So it's very logical. And then, so it's possibility that we can get rid of this, uh, these negative emotions. So that is the second teaching. Uh, cessation or mm. origin. Origin. Start. Uh -huh. of course. Then the third teaching is the path. How to get rid of, how to get rid of these negative emotions. So then there is many, many different, uh, different mm -hmm. teachings according to the, uh, the capacity, huh? no. capacity of the, of the beings. So there are Theravada teachings, then there is Mahayana teachings, Vajrayana teachings, according to the people's kind of uh, <coughs> capacity. So I think in, uh, like, simply, if we sort of put in simple, uh, the Shavakayana or, or the Theravada tradition, uh, mostly focus on using a kind of antidote. Instead of anger, what is the op antidote of the anger? It's a loving kindness. So by increasing loving kindness, then you naturally have a less, less anger. So similarly, each of these negative emotions has an antidote. So by increasing the antidote, then you are naturally decrease uh, those negative emotions which causes the suffering. Example, you cannot uh, uh, give a handshake to somebody and same time punch in the face. Either you, 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 <laughs> you give a handshake or you punch, right? So like that. So that's a basic uh, kind of very simple logic. So that's kind of Shavakayana or, or uh, <clears throat> then when it comes to Mahayana practice, with uh, someone with a little bit more uh, more open mind or, or bigger faculty, then we can use these negative emotions to or transform transform negative emotions. So first, I think we have to recognize recognize this anger, hatred, jealousy, saying that oh now I have I have this anger, or oh, now I have this jealousy, now I have this. So, I think. Of course, many people kind of always complain about anger, or oh, I have this anger and all that. Yes, of course, <laughs> anger is not really pleasant. Nobody sort of uh, feels very comfortable when you're so angry. Um, but anger is easy to detect, I feel. Because when you're angry, then um, of course everybody has ex <laughs> experienced anger, but sort of... Uh, face becomes red. If you're white, it becomes even more red. <laughs> and then you short of breath. I mean, it's a lot of signs that uh, you are getting angry. So that I think maybe more, once you diagnose like a, like a health, uh, when you go to hospital, once doctor diagnose uh, what your sickness is, then it's more easy to prescribe medicine. If it's not diagnosed, then you don't know how to be treated, right? So similarly, I think when you recognize your anger, then okay, now I have anger. Then there are so many different ways of dealing with these angers, which is the whole teaching of the Buddha. Then similarly, other negative emotions. And there's more subtle kind of negative emotions, which is like pride or jealousy, which comes very, very kind of subtle. So we don't really sort of notice that kind of pride is coming up. Then once, when you cannot diagnose or cannot notice it's coming, then I think difficult to use the antidote. So even some of our senior Dhamma practice, it is very much possible that you can be so arrogant thinking I'm not proud. <laughs> 
So then I think we get caught into that. Then we really don't know. There's a lot of examples in the teachings that I've read. Like if the medicine becomes poisoned, then there's no antidote. So like that. <clears throat> so also jealousy, I think very subtle, sort of works behind the scene, which sometimes you get angry, but it is actually caused by the jealousy. So you don't really realize that. And then it's sort of all pivoting into your mind and suddenly you, you burst into anger. So anyway, number one, first, I think important is to recognize these negative emotions. And then once we recognize the negative emotions, then we have all the equipments and the, the teachings of Buddha. Example, like in the Lobjongs, if you feel strong anger, first recognize the anger. And then by uh, one method is thinking that with this anger, may I bring all the anger of all sentient beings. May I bring the people who are suffering with anger into my anger and then dissolve into space. So using this kind of method, which is, I think, very, very helpful. So first we, diagnose, we recognize these negative emotions, then using antidote. And then by using antidote, then you can use, use that into positive. Normally the negative emotions are negative, but if you can use properly, then it can be transformed. So this is more of, we can say that Mahayana way of practicing. <coughs> Then ultimately, with the higher faculty, higher faculty, then Vajrayana teaching comes. And Vajrayana teaching is uh, um, not really openly given in India. It was uh, called secret, secret Mantrayana, not because it has faults, but maybe it is difficult for people to perceive. Uh, so therefore, many Paditas in India, like Nalanda University, they used to practice Vajrayana, but very secretly. So I don't think people can uh, know right away who's practicing and who's not practicing. And they have this kind of small box on the side in the painting you can see, it's called Samato. That's where they hide the Vajrayana implements, is it? Implement? Bell and Dorje. It looks like ladies' makeup box, but it's, but it's round. So that's where they hide everything. So nobody knows until sometimes there are stories that we hear that um, sometimes that uh, they sort of break the monastery rules. And then um, I'm not going to go into details. But <laughs> and then disciplinary sort of scolds them and then they could go through the walls. So that means they already realize, realize beings, but they stay very quiet. So there are many stories like that. And then the, when Guru Rinpoche came to Tibet, then Vajrayana teaching was taught more openly, openly to Tibet. And uh, I think mm, he thought is the, the place and the time is right. Um, <clears throat> so for the people who are, I think, to really practice the Vajrayana uh, practice, then you have to be really open and uh, able to accept uh, broader mind, broader mind. So how the Vajrayana uh, practice works is that uh, <clears throat> so when you join into Vajrayana practice, then you have to go through the uh, uh, receiving empowerment. We call it one, and then there's called the base empowerment, and then the path empowerment, then the fruit, fruit empowerment. Mm, so many people uh, in Asia when the teachers, they give uh, public empowerment, then sometimes Himalayan people or Tibetan people, they would just attend the empowerment, not really pay so much attention to what's going on, uh, but they take it as a blessing. So that's one, one, way of, one way of receiving. They just make aspiration and they just get the vase on their head and then drink the, and drink the Amita. And sometimes they don't even know what empowerment they receive. That happens a lot. But it's okay because you receive the kind of a blessing and you have a pure kind of devotion and all that. So those who want to, to really put into practice and those who, those who finish the preliminary practice, then they have to, in order to do the development stage practice, they have to receive uh, Abhisheka or empowerment properly. And so that is what we call the base empowerment is the, uh, our inherent Buddha nature which has the 
all the three kayas within itself. So that is what we call the basic empowerment. And then with an authentic teacher using the, the, the symbolic implements and going through the text and then putting the vase and the amrita and all that. So this is a part of the path empowerment. <clears throat> so by, uh, and those empowerments are given in four sections. Um, the first is the vasi empowerment. Once we receive the vasi empowerment, then we meditate upon the, what we call the uh, visualizing oneself as a deity. Um, so we practice on the um, appearance and emptiness. Appearance, emptiness. So we do practice on that kind of uh, particular kind of meditation. Then the second empowerment is given with the uh, symbolically given with a nectar. Uh, so that is to, with this, after receiving that, then we train our mind, uh, practice uh, what we call the uh, bliss. Clarity. Clarity. Clarity and emptiness. Clarity and emptiness. So we train in that. And then when we receive the third empowerment, um, then we, after receiving this, usually the master uses a kind of a sign or symbol. And then after receiving that, then we practice on the bliss and emptiness. Then ultimately, the fourth empowerment, which is given with the introduction to the mind with the, the, what we call the words, words empowerment. And after receiving that, then we receive, uh, we meditate and the awareness and emptiness, rikton. So these are the, these are the stages. So after receiving that, then we go through all this uh, training and practicing of our mind. Then what we call the, the fruit empowerment is then we will actualize the Buddha within, uh, sort of uh, actualize. So this is the base empowerment, then the path empowerment, which is receiving empowerment and practicing on those four stages of de uh, development stage or with the get Characteristic and non-characteristic. Yeah. So creation phase practice and then completion phase with and without characteristics. <clears throat> yeah, so ultimately then we actualize the Buddha nature within. So that is called the fruit empowerment. So this is just kind of brief, very, very brief uh, explanation of the once we get into the Vajrayana uh, practice. So this is this word where Rambhaji says this. With the support of a human life endowed with freedoms that is like a budding sprout of accomplishment, you enter the doors of the sutras and the tantras, receiving ripening empowerments and liberating instructions. If you heed my counsel now, there is no doubt you'll cross the ocean of samsara and reach liberation shore. So this is what is emphasized in the second verse. So here is sort of confirms uh, in this point, sort of confirms that um, without sort of wasting our opportunity, mm -hmm. losing our opportunity with full confidence, if you can really put into practice, I sort of guarantee that you will be free from the samsaric world of the samsara. The third verse reads, The direct path of secret mantra is to look at the nature of your mind, luminosity and emptiness without partiality. You have never been separated from this suchness. Have confidence, confidence and don't be distracted. Hold it with mindfulness. So most important in the uh, practice of the Vajrayana, which is looking at the nature of one's mind. So, so this usually um, <clears throat> the student goes through all the, the preliminary practice, preliminary practice like Mondo practice. And then you are trained into what I mentioned earlier, all the development stage practice. 
Then at the end, the fourth empowerment, where the um, Guru gives, uh, authentic master gives introduction to your mind. Then once we, so how, how is given is there are so many different uh, methods. One, once the student is uh, uh, mature, mature. Uh, mature enough with all the accumulations, it is mentioned in, uh, in Kinsal and Mishalung and all the other teachings. It is we must have to go through Sanam de Yeshegit Sonsam. Sanam de Yeshegit Sonsam. Accumulating the collections of merit and wisdom. So, all this Ngundro and all this practice is a way to accumulate uh, wisdom and, and, and merit. So, we have to have accumulate all this wisdom and merit properly, then I think when we are ready, then we, Guru gives some kind of a, um, brief kind of instruction or, or kind of gesture. So then you get introduced to your mind. Um, so that is the, the most uh, important um, practice. And there are many stories, maybe I already told last time, but um, one of the stories of the Padrun, which is his teacher, uh, Do Chense. Yeah. And uh, he came to see Do Chense, and then he sort of had a kind of a doubt to his, uh, his teacher, kind of doubt, because he couldn't maybe last small bit of not purify no. fully, kind of purify his, uh, his karmic. So he had a doubt, kind of doubt in his teacher because of the way, way the teacher was, uh, yeah, there. And then teacher got up and took his hair and uh, dragged him up and down. I think Patrimbaj had a long hair. And then actually he kicked him and he said, you mad dog, you mad dog, how can you have such a wrong view of your teacher? And then that moment he got introduced to his mind. So that's the one kind of scenario. Uh, is, is it okay? <laughs> you know, my, sometimes I use maybe wrong, so. <laughs> so it's not always the beating case. <laughs> and when Patarumbish gave introduction to his student, uh, they were sitting in the uh, Dzogchen kind of uh, uh, meadow outside. And then he looked up in the sky and he told, do you see the stars in the sky? And Yoshilungu says, yes. Do you hear the dogs barking in the valley, down the valley? He said, yes. And he said, what is the nature of your mind? So then he sort of got the, he got the introduced to your mind. So I think um, it sounds so simple, but I think we need a lot of uh, accumulating, accumulating merit. Because this teaching is always there from the beginning, even from the Ngundra time, there's always this introduction to the mind is always there. Even I think we do simple basic practice, there's always this introduction is there. So when you reach to the uh, level where it's time to kind of point out, then I think so. You, what you have been practicing before is already already there. No. Uh, am I clear? No. Okay. So here, which says once. You, uh, we get this kind of introduction, then I think most important is to maintaining maintaining that same So what is like nature of mind? means So essentially the direct path of secret mantra is to Look at the nature of your mind, which is um, not just a void, rather it is emptiness conjoined with luminosity. And it is not luminosity in and of itself, but rather luminosity conjoined with emptiness. So the union of the two, luminosity and emptiness, without the slightest partiality. So it's always been with us. It is not something that 
uh, some master sort of put you in or is not something that when you guru, do practice Guru Yoga and Guru dissolve in oneself and then you, be, you get the Buddha nature. It's not like that. It's sort of something new. We always have it with you. It's only because we uh, don't recognize that. So I think that's what Dinamya Tarmanyo Tabar Chani Yobate. So this is something that is uh, always with us and we have never been separated from it. So how to, how to maintain that? Just uh, witness through So having been introduced uh, to the nature of the mind, then simply put, one needs to hold that in mind without the slightest distraction. Accordingly, have confidence in what you've been introduced to and don't be distracted. Hold it with mindfulness. So always kind of um, being aware, I think it's a very important thing. No matter uh, what you're doing, you're in the office or you're waiting for bus. We do a lot of waitings in our life, waiting to get into theater, waiting Lama to turn up, waiting for airplane ticket, waiting for queue in the bathroom. So we always have this time. So I think no, you don't have to right away sit in the posture and then close your eye. But I think you can just be wherever you are, but just to be aware. Oh, yes. Okay. Ah. Uh, observe. 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 Now, see, Kondiji Chen and Malukun, Trube, Tale, Tela, Tamjekun, Tony, Nasam Juba Talabab, Dedu, Juma, Miju, Jemaju. Everything, be it of samsara or nirvana, is mistaken, a mere imputation. Understand all is emptiness beyond word, thought, and explanation. Don't chain a chase after images. The illusions of happiness and suffering. So I think it's very uh, <clears throat> can be very um, how say, easy to kind of see because we all have different kind of uh, perception of uh, all all the phenomena. If things are in, by nature, something good or bad, then everybody will view the same. So some people see it's beautiful, and some people see it's very ugly. So that shows that it is your own mind projection. It's not necessarily, it's, it's, uh, that's how it is. Like the building there is crooked. So. <laughs> If that crooked building is in Nepal, it's a bad architecture. <laughs> but when it's in New York, it is art. <laughs> so, so, so it's the same, same thing. It depends where you are and how you perceive. So likewise, everything, all phenomena, I think there are so many kind of, we don't have to uh, study very big uh, philosophy idea behind. If you search, analyze, all the perceptions, this is mostly your own mental project. And these days, I think more and more people talk about that, I see in that. So, all the perception phenomena, it is your own mind projection, which is clean, not clean, dirty. Certain things that is very dirty for us, it's not, not dirty for others. So, there are many things. So understanding that all the perceptions outside, it is nothing but kind of a dream, dream and illusion. So to, get, to make it a little, maybe you heard this story to make it a little interesting, I'll tell a kind of a story, a joke. There was one guy, he, has a, he was dreaming, he was having a nightmare. And then in his dream, he was chased by a demon. So he was chased up and down, up and down, and finally he was cornered. And he, he got so scared that he, he has nowhere to run. 
And he asked the demon, what shall I do? Are you so scared? And the demon said, uh, demon, demon said I don't know, it's your dream. <laughs> so, so, we, <laughs> so we live in kind of our, our dream world. Uh, and we yet, I think that our dream is so strong, so strong that we, we cling to it and become so reality. Um, like I think when we watch movie, um, we, even though we know it is not real, we know that behind the scene there's a director, there's a cameraman, there's an actor, and even the bloods are not real, all the scenes are not real, but yet we sort of feel uh, sometimes very scared, sometimes very um, sad. But that's kind of, we have so kind of attachment to the perception, the phenomena. So that, I think we need a lot of practice. We can't just read saying it's a dream and illusion and then act as that, that we understand. I don't think we really understand. There was this uh, virtual reality kind of experiment that you were a glass. You're actually on the ground, flat ground, and you were a glass, and you know you're on ground, but in your eye you see a clip. And first, oh, I thought it's easy. You can just, you know, you know you're on ground. But then once you put the glasses on, you're not able to take one step. Maybe you guys should try. So I think just mere kind of mentally understanding is is not enough. Recently, I was in, in France and um, there was this kind of uh, mountain, uh, what do you call that? Ski lift. S ski lift. I went up to the mountain in the ski lift and it was quite windy and the lift was small. And there was a French man who was coming with me. And then the, the lift was a little bit shaking. Then I got scared. I said, oh, I, I am, I'm scared. And he also received a lot of teaching. This Frenchman was with me. And he told me in kind of French, strong French accent, he said, isn't this an illusion? <laughs> <clears throat> so I couldn't stop laughing. I said, theoretically, yes, but still I'm afraid. So I think many teachings, they say it's dream and illusion. Of course, sometimes we, we think it's easy, ah, it's dream and illusion, but then when situation, circumstances come, and even though we have some certain kind of experience in practice, when it really reality hits, then it's difficult to deal. So I think it shows that it's not intellectual understanding or just philosophical understanding. A little bit of meditation is not enough. So to see really dream and illusion means that then there's not really real no fear. There are stories of some masters when about to be kind of um, experience very harsh kind of reality and then they had no fear. So there are some stories, amazing stories like that. So I think here what Rinpoche says, um, all the phenomena, all the perception is like, like a dream. And it, I think we need to practice that, not just understanding. Always times so when, when, especially when the difficult situations comes arise, then we have to practice saying that this is a dream and this is illusion. Then check our kind of mental reaction to that fear or whatever. Then if it still affects us so much, then I think it shows that uh, we need to do more training. And especially if it involves, involves us, it affects more. If somebody's like criticizing or, or somebody is sort of like a uh, little bit harm to you, then it's a little bit difficult to, to go into the state of thinking it's, it's nothing but it's dream and illusion. So here it says that everything is dream and illusion. Try not to just to take it so seriously. Huh? Whatever good or bad action occurs is set free 
the moment it arises. This has always been the experience of sentient beings. Yet, not recognizing the natural state, they follow an erroneous path, aspire to realize the suchness of compassion. So I think once we have a little kind of um, uh, experience, a little train, like sometime in the teachings it says that by training your mind that um, again and again it becomes like a very good horse rider. If you're really good at riding horse, no matter how much the horse jump, you don't really fall off. So likewise, if we have really trained our mind, seeing example, uh, one example is that the dream and illusion thing. If we really train our mind, then it does not affect, affect our uh, mind mental state. So here is Zanyan Kangjung, Shardun Yambai. So then once we have this little experience, then whatever kind of um, thoughts, positive or negative, then it doesn't leave trace like a bird flying uh, in the sky, there's no trace. So even good, um, don't become too happy and too kind of uh, uh, excited. excited. It's like, again, sort of disappears. If it's something terrible, bad thing happens, again, it happens, but then it doesn't leave trace, it sort of disappears. <coughs> so that kind of, uh, it's always been with us, just because we do not recognize. We follow, we follow, the, we follow into this kind of dream and thinking is real. Quite often, um, given example, it's like throwing stone at the, at the dog. If you throw a stone at the dog, the dog will chase the stone. So you can throw many stones behind the dog. So likewise, those who follow their dreams, kind of, uh, then you have continuity of more and more kind of dreams. And uh, example that how we should practice is like throwing stone at a lion. And when you throw stone at a lion, lion looks at the person who's throwing, one who's throwing the stone, and he gets scared. He cannot throw, throw the second stone. So likewise, don't follow, don't follow these kind of thoughts to make its continuity. So make an aspiration with a strong kind of compassion. We all sentient beings, we caught in this samsara, we suffer because we follow our kind of deluded mind and this kind of dream we like. So therefore all sentient beings suffer. So we should have generated strong loving kindness and make a strong aspiration that you actualize the realization. Nelu Ritong Jimba Machuba Nyaba Tenji Peman Juni Soa Tamna Nami and Dundrani Mugu Dumichi do Tela Cholos. The natural state, naked awareness and emptiness without any contrivance, is the ultimate Padmasambhava. If, with respect and longing, you supplicate him as such, no matter what happens, be it happy or sad, you'll never be parted. <clears throat> so in Vajrayana practice, we uh, very much emphasize on relying upon authentic teacher. Authentic teacher means the teacher who go through uh, practice, receive the instructions and go through practice, and then uh, become authentic master. So I often uh, talk about Jabji uh, Kenzer Rinpoche, how he become Jabji Tengu Kenzer Rinpoche. It's not just a kind of a, a title that's given him of a big lama or something like that. But Rinpoche went through so many uh, hardship. Rinpoche? Hardship. Difficulties. Difficulties. Oh, difficult. Difficult. Hardship. 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 Um, Rinpoche became, like, Kenzi Rinpoche is one example of many of these great Tibetan masters. He was, he had a lot of, um, uh, can, uh, he had a lot of um, opportunities, right? Opportunities. Ah, Kokapura. Rinpoche had a lot of opportunities. 
First of all, he was born in the noble kind of family who was very much supportive of Kenzi Rinpoche uh, becoming um, Lama and want to practice. So they were ready to financially uh, or, or the needs, needs support, him. support him, needs him to practice, going into practice. There's some stories of some teacher, even they want to practice, they want to meditate, they don't have the means. So there are many stories like that. For Kenzi Rinpoche, he had that noble family who, first they didn't really support him to become uh, a lama. They want him to take care of their legacy, family legacy. So that's one kind of condition he had. Then second thing is he had a very, very good, uh, his elder brother, senior monk, very good monk, and who already meet, going around and meeting so many great masters. So he knew who are the good masters. To, to rely upon. Then thirdly, Kenji Rinpoche was recognized as reincarnation of many Lama. First, uh, he was also recognized as the, the common question of Payul lineage, which his father refused to give. Then he was recognized as sixth Shishin Ramjam also, and father refused to give. And he was recognized as Wembo Tenka, one of the very great Dzogchen master, father refused to give. So his father was kind of a uh, high-ranking noble family. He said, anybody calls my son a tulku, I'm going to whip them 100, 100 times. <laughs> and finally, Shishin Gyatsab Rinpoche, his father's really dear, very uh, root teacher. And Rinpoche told father that uh, he must uh, become a lama and practice. But still, father was a little bit hesitant, but then Kenzi Rinpoche had a very bad accident, and then they asked all the lamas for divination and all that. So they said he will only live what he came to do. You know, if you let him practice and become become a um, lama, then he will survive. Otherwise, he will not survive. So then, father quickly decided to let his son go. So this we have this shot in the Kenzi Rinpoche's live video. I think father quickly made ropes before Kenzi Rinpoche was still bedridden. And father quickly made ropes and put on the bed and all this. So he didn't want his, he didn't want to lose his son. So anyway, so Rinpoche's brother knew which master to rely upon. And then, like I mentioned before, all those great masters, they felt Kenzi Rinpoche was the reincarnation of their teacher. So they would take special care of Kenzi Rinpoche. And then on top of all that, Rinpoche was so diligent in practicing. So all these circumstances, the way circumstances made made Kenzi Rinpoche who he is. So for even even someone like Kenzi Rinpoche, you just don't have a, like a title or something like that to become great master. They have to go through purification. He spent more, almost like twenty years in retreat. He he met like fifty different teachers. Main teacher was Shishin Gelsa and uh, also Kenzi Chujiloju. But he has uh, fifty different teachers from the fifty different schools. So I think when we read the life stories of the those great masters, and there are many different great masters like that, life story of those great masters, then we realize it's not just easy to become realized master just because uh, we read some text and we memorize some text. That's not enough. So then how, that's how Kenzo Rinpoche became. So many lamas in Tibet uh, go through like that training, practice, meditation, so they become a great master. So we are fortunate to many of those masters uh, come out of, out of Tibet and spread the Dharma all over the, all over the world. So when you, once you have this kind of authentic master, uh, someone you can really trust, trust with your heart. So then you rely upon uh, that master. The reason why I think we have to rely upon uh, uh, outer guru is always in the guru yoga and the teachings of the uh, upper guru yoga always says that ultimate guru is within oneself, the Buddha nature that we all have. So in order to actualize this Buddha nature, we have to rely upon the outer kind of guru. So ultimate guru is that Buddha nature. So we are still uh, ignorant beings, so we need some kind of source of inspiration. The, uh, qualified authentic master. So once we find this quality, qualified authentic master, then we rely totally 
if you want to practice Vajrayana uh, kind of path, then we rely upon upon that completely. Like uh, when we fly from one city to another city, and uh, we rely upon the fully rely upon the captain of the pilot of the of the plane. And if you don't really, if you see the pilot is behaving a little bit strange, you might not board the plane. So I think we have to find we have to find a good air company uh, who hires a very good qualified pilot, and then meantime, good air hostess, good food, all this comes. Then you reach to the destination. And similarly, I think in order to really properly uh, practice Vajrayana, you have to find a perfect Sangha, perfect community. And then the teacher has to be like authentic master who really knows how to guide you in the path. Then ultimately, then here he uh, says that ultimate Guru Padma, here which is referring to uh, Guru Padma Sambhava, ultimate uh, Riktong, awareness and emptiness without fabricating that is the ultimate Padma Sambhava. So then you introduce to Inner Guru. And Sultan Namyandundam. So you trust and have a kind of a, a mega aspiration. Then it's always with you. Always with you. So when how we rely upon the teacher is Kiduk Kiduk Telachor means it's up to up to you now. It's kind of because I think the one thing that we all uh, suffer in this world is too much hope and too much fear. So, good practitioner should not have this kind of hope and fear, whatever it is up to, uh, up to spiritual master, Kiduk. And then that sort of gives us much better uh, kind of uh, uh, way of living also. Sometimes I meet uh, people who are in, <coughs> um, how do you say, uh, very sick and last stage. So the most difficult is that hope and fear. So if you, have, if you can train your mind to have fully trust in that authentic guru and rely upon it and whatever happens, and also there's some prayer, very, very beautiful prayer that uh, says that if I better to live, let, let me live. If I better to die, let me die. This kind of fully confident. But yet, of course, we have to we have to go to hospital, <laughs> we have to see doctor, all those things, but without too much hope and fear. Um, since there's still some time left, so I can tell maybe a story, maybe a joke. It's, it's a Western joke. <laughs> So one, uh, someone, someone was uh, about to drown in the water and then she's praying to God, saying, please save me, please save me. And then some, one boat by bus saying, oh, come, come, we have one space. And she says, no, no, the God will save me. So that boat went. Second boat came, come, come. And she said, no, no, I'm, I pray to God, God will save me. Third boat came, she didn't go. And then finally she died, she drowned. And then she went to heaven and complained to God, saying that, why didn't you save me? I praised to you. And God said, I sent three boats, so you didn't get on it. <laughs> so we have full confidence and faith in Guru, but yet we have to, <laughs> we have to use the uh, relative world kind of treatment, take care of our health, all this, but our mental state, uh, having fully trust and confidence. So I think people with this kind of capacity who, ex who are able to accept this kind of fully trust, then I think that's the uh, right uh, kind of uh, um, basket to receive the, the Vajrayana uh, teachings. So I think that that's the end of it, one page. And Rigmin Jeja, Rigmin Jepe Shazan, Janieta, Tewar Gejo, Neto Mimbaye, Melam Samo, Jempen Sem Jeji, Jaltop Jansong Dormen on the Pulu. Before too long, I shall certainly behold your joyful face again. Until that time, keep ripening the fruit of your virtue. I seal this profound aspiration with benevolence and bodhicitta and offer it from within the unfailing protection of refuge.
So we can also sort of refer this. Uh, it is actually sort of ending of the letter by sending it. But we can also look at that. Those who have this kind of trust and faith, I will see you very soon, isn't it? We can, we can see that. Then meantime, try to accumulate, uh, accumulate merit. Properly. Gejonet means properly practice and accumulate, accumulate merit. And make an aspiration, and most importantly, generate loving kindness. Shempenji Semche. Generate loving kindness to all sentient beings. If you do that, and then sort of the geltop, jetop, jetop means like a melamjita jetapa. Seal it with uh, seal it with prayer or dedication. So it will be always that that will be always protected through so on dolme And that if you want to accumulate great merit and then dedicate uh, the result of said merit, then that will kind of keep the merit or it's like banking the merit so it remains with you until it is fulfilled. So this looks like to a noble kind of daughter and that in which she wrote uh, this uh, teaching. And um, like I mentioned before, most of the, the letters that Rinpoche write to, write to people always about practice. So all the letters actually we can use as a kind of uh, uh, his uh, advice to shout them. Advice. Yeah, advice. Should we no, have some? Oh, yeah, long. So we'll go through some transmission of the. Saraswati practice and Manjushri practice, was, which has been translated by the Nalinda Translation, Translation Committee. Committee. And those who wish to have the text in English, maybe can contact them. Yanjim Bhami Dudavi, Jimmy Zaja Jama Shusu, Namun Pajin Jundi, Inji, Michelle Pajin, Chimang, the Jutuman Zajunga, Yaja, the Bajam Zajan, the Homo Majan Jayan, or is it? Bojimanjusemjedor, always had a sense of humor. This when he composed, I think it's composed for Ujin Jinpen. He said, even though I have white hair and blue eye. I still recite poem from my mouth. Jisin jambe yang kau berdoa dengan tuan tuan jambe tamu lagi. Kacau untuk mesin untuk tuan tuan jisin untuk tuan tuan. Jambu yang jauh sangat dengan jambu yang cerdik untuk tuan tuan jisin untuk tuan tuan. Jambu yang jauh sangat dengan jambu yang cerdik untuk tuan tuan jisin untuk tuan tuan. Jisin pada jadi jambu yang sedih jangan kau main jangan jisin untuk tuan tuan. Jambu yang jauh sangat dengan jambu yang cerdik untuk tuan tuan. Tell 
Ho anche sentito la denna già da 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 So so yanda ribe to ngale lobe beje bonga ngale hamje zeyo ba jinze juje geo zeno ni maro ya yo lobe a yenge zo bonga ngale so jambar ka bo moti luje mati luje beta zeyo ba jinze bonga ngale zeyo ba jinze bonga ngale zeyo ba jinze bonga ngale zeyo sanje cho da ngale zeyo beta zeyo ba jinze bonga ngale 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 zeyo ba jinze bonga Pensen ne cümbezo java yin ni Last time I was giving transmission in the in the zoom and someone was listening in the flat with maybe a little bit loud and the neighbor saying are you practicing the swiss trumpet <laughs> <laughs> The lung sounds like Swiss trumpet. <coughs> okay, so maybe we can. Rimshe, can you share a time when your grandfather <coughs> really helped you feel confident in your own innate ability to share his teachings and how you experienced this? Was it something he said or did? that helped instill your confidence as a teacher? As a teacher, I'm still, I don't consider as a teacher. <laughs> like you mentioned, I think uh, since I was three, three or four, then I spent uh, time with Kenzi Rinpoche till Rinpoche passed away. So that's a little more than 20 years. So whenever, Kenzi Rinpoche would give teaching or transmission. He would always wait for me and always call me to sit there. So I'm not so diligent, I'm not so smart, I'm a lazy. Um, but he always makes sure that I was there. So I feel that um, I think he wanted me to trans transmit, transmit his lineage and teaching. So I feel that's my kind of um, responsibility responsibility and that's all I also feel that's a way I can sort of repay his kindness so these days I try to do as much as um, transmissions that I can I'm quite good at reading as you see I'm quite good at reading. <laughs> I might get a not the first gold medal but second I might I can read fast that's thanks to my grandmother She always uh, pushed me to train read. She, she was not so favorable of me naming, uh, me becoming a Tulku. She said, oh, Tulku, you'll not be very successful, very good, you know. <laughs> she doesn't want to give a name, Tulku. But his son is 16 Karmapa, uh, sort of, because she's very uh, devoted to 16 Karmapa. So Karmapa said, okay, we have to make him Tulku. So I, I became a Tulku. And, uh, So now she said, now since you already got the name of Tulku, now in the future you will have to give transmission, so you have to study. So she made me learn read fast, so I can read quite fast. So I feel confident to give uh, transmissions, not so much confident in giving empowerment because I can feel I don't have fully qualified uh, as a Vajra master, but I have not much choice. I become a victim of people's pure vision. <laughs> But uh, so I feel that's what Rinpoche wanted. So I, yes. Thank you, Rinpoche. 
Rinpoche, you spoke about the uh, base empowerment, the path empowerment, and the fruit empowerment. And the text talked about the ripening empowerment and liberating instructions. Can you explain the connection between those? She you spoke about she lump table. Yeah. Then? Okay. But since the, there's only one page, I have to fill two hours, so I had to say something. Right? So, <laughs> I try to put in as much as I can. Sometimes I say things that then I get in trouble in the end. <clears throat> of, course, <laughs> of course, you receive the Abhisheka, it's like the, the putting the seed into it. I, I remember asking Kansan Rinpoche because I used to attend uh, initiations from very young age. So at one point I said, is there any use for me just sitting there because I don't know what's going on. I'm always sitting there. And the mercy doesn't matter. You just sit there and receive the initiation. And when you grow up, you, you, when you want to practice, you already have the seed. So then I said, okay. So then that's how I sit. So the, after receiving initiation, then you have to learn how to practice, how to visualize, <clears throat> how to, like I mentioned, that all the different stages of the practice. Then there is an explanation given by uh, disclose on the on the sadhana or practice. So that is what we call the liberating instructions. Tirwa. Liberating instructions. So you know how to practice them properly. So that is, I think, what you meant. What, what you meant. Thank you, Rimshe. How do we accumulate the collections of merit and wisdom? Yeah, that's I think it's very important. Even in Kinzan Lame Shalom, even in every teaching, nowhere it says you don't need to do accumulation and you get direct to Dzogchen. It is very clear, even you read Kinzan Lame Shalom, Toden Lame, what was it? Tsosa Diva Tabe Lagjeta, Toden Lame Chilam Konale. So with uh, accumulating wisdom and merit, merit, merit and wisdom, okay. then with the blessing of Guru, you actualize the, you actualize the Buddha nature. It is very clearly mentioned. There's no teaching which says you directly get the Buddha nature. So I think any kind of uh, accumulation, there's like six parameter and postation, then there's mandala offering, and there's uh, mainly the, what you call Yanadimba. Seven branch accumulation. Seven branch accumulation, which is uh, essential, essential practice. So these are all, by doing so, we accumulate the merit. Now, Adding understanding of the the one who does and actually doing and then the correct object, understanding that everything nothing but emptiness. With adding that understanding of emptiness, that accumulates uh, merit, uh, wisdom. wisdom, wisdom merit. So any practice we can do, like even like generosity, you want to give something to someone with a genuine kind of love and compassion, then understanding that. The, the action of giving, the giver, and then recipient. recipient, everything, within the understanding of emptiness, and then you naturally accumulate the wisdom. So I think that, that too has to go together. Without understanding of emptiness, then we are just accumulating the, the merit of the wisdom. Thank you, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, what is the best way to follow the instructions of our teacher? Best way to Instruction of teacher. Best way to follow. Best way to follow the instruction of teacher, then I think to follow the instruction. <laughs> I don't know how to say. <laughs> Do it properly, I don't <laughs> Rinpoche, when will you come back to New York to teach the Dharma further? <laughs> yeah, I, I have many friends here and uh, many friends like yourself and all invite me to come with, uh, again, a victim of peer vision. Um, 
I very much love to come and meet a lot of friends we have here. So, like I mentioned before, I try to uh, do as much as I can uh, transmit the, the lineages I have received, especially the, the lung, the transmissions. So I have few sort of um, pile up Commitment. commitments that I have to do. So in the meantime, I find time. I would very much love to come. <laughs> What advice do you have for practitioners, long-term, many-year practitioners who encounter obstacles in their practice? Obstacles in their practice. <clears throat> obstacles in practice and in life. Practice. Um, so I think best way to utilize all the obstacles when everything is so smooth, then there's no way of really seeing that how your practice is going. So a little bit of bumpy ride is good, I think, that some obstacle come. Then we are, we sort of, of course, if it's a very big thing and you cannot practice, then it's difficult. But otherwise, in life, I think uh, so <laughs> sometimes you, you stay in the mountain and retreat and meditate. There was no one bothering you, so you don't really test and have a test to your life. So I sometimes say, when you live in the worldly life, then you face a lot of challenges in life. So that, I think time, we should not uh, go off the track. Um, so utilize them. So if we try to see that every kind of obstacle, every uh, obstacle comes in life, use them to boost your practice. You know, there's a story of uh, one master, he was uh, doing practice, uh, meditating in retreat. And he had an attendant who always uh, do the wrong thing. He forget to feed the master. He sometimes like you know they break the calves. Always, always make difficulty. And some of the benefactors came and say, "Why don't you just you know change this attendant? Because he's always doing you know like not serving you properly." And he said, "This is the object, my object of patience. <laughs> Without him, there's no one to practice patience." So I think. <laughs> if you do proper proper kind of you know practice, I think I think more you have a challenge in life. Of course, we need some kind of uh, deep uh, deep kind of training. But when you have more more challenges, then I think there's a more kind of chance to practice. So if we look, if we able to look it like that way, I think there's no obstacle. Is my clear? Okay. Saying is easy, but doing may be more challenging. But I think if you try to think like that, yeah. Thank you. Last question. <clears throat> Excuse me. If everything is a dream or mirage, how do we know what matters? How do we figure out what to care about? So we live in we live in kind of dream and dream and illusion. I think this is important to remind us. Uh, again and again, but of course, we should not fall into the action, should not fall into the view. So we should always try to remember that everything is dream and illusion, but action, we have to act accordingly. We cannot just, uh, I don't know, hit up. <laughs> Sometimes we have this kind of uh, uh, experience, some, some, heard some stories of uh, retreatants, masters, they meditate and then they sort of sometimes feel that everything is like dream and illusion and then they hit their hand on the wall thinking it will go through and then they <laughs> they hurt themselves. So there is in the teaching always says the view and the action. The view should be vast as vast as we can, but the action should be fine. So of course, even though we have this some understanding of uh, certain understanding of dream and illusion things are not real, then we still have to act, act accordingly. And in fact, I think uh, you can be with uh, so many people who, but yet, because of your mental attitude, that you are among the others, you're always different. It doesn't make sense. Example, if you have a horror movie, horror movie being seen, and then you have uh, 
uh, some some nomad from Tibet who has never seen a movie, blindfold and bring into the movie theater, and then show the horror movie, and that person might have a heart attack because he doesn't know it's a, it's a, it's a movie, right? So, but other people who know there's a movie has a less effect. The one who doesn't know it's a movie is a more effect. That does make sense, huh? We should experiment that maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so if you know it's a it's a movie, then it's a less effect. If you don't know it's a movie, then it affects more. So if we can see the the life, the world around is like nothing but kind of a dream and illusion manifest from your ignorant mind, then I think things become much less. Even even like some obstacles you might. Uh, feel less, less effective. I think this uh, long time ago, I was in LA, uh, Fox studio, movie studio, and they were making some TV serial show. And I was wearing robes and I was standing there. And one of the actor wearing as a doctor, you know, dressed as doctor, and came to me and saying, are you real? Sounds like a trick question. <laughs> well, that concludes our evening. Thank you so much, Rinpoche, for your teachings, for your presence. Please come back and teach us again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So? Thank you.